Alrighty, champs, let's get into today's class on number. So, first trigger I can think of is whenever I see a shape inside another shape, then I start to count the number of sides of each one of these shapes. Because sometimes it's the shape on the inside has uh, less sides than set A, whereas in set B, it's more sides on the inside shape. Or it's something like there's always a difference of three between the sides of the shapes. And there's a difference of four, maybe in set B, something like that. So whenever you see a shape inside another shape, start to count. Whenever you see those looping intersections that would have been mentioned earlier, I think in the shape category, is um, start to think about the number of in enclosed spaces that you have essentially, or you know, transversely, the number of intersections that you have. Sometimes it'll be the same number, sometimes it won't be, but just start to count essentially. Now, next, whenever you see dots of any kind, that is your invitation to start counting the number of dots because there's nothing else you can really do with dots. And dots are a nice way to make any sort of number pattern come alive. So for example, if there's a square and there's four dots in set A, whereas in set B, <laughs> there's a square and there's five dots instead, then you know it probably has to do with the number of sides and how the number of dots relate to that. So for example, the, the number could equal the number of sides of the shape here, whereas here, it could be the sides plus one equals the number of dots in this case. Next, whenever you see random shapes in general, I think it's just good to keep in mind odd versus even, whether it comes to the number of shapes that are in each box or the number of sides that are in each box as well. So for example, this is especially applicable whenever you see comparable squares within each set. So for example, if in one square you've got a heptagon and in another square you've got this arrow looking thing, it's good to know that this is a seven sided shape and the heptagon would also have seven sides. So whenever you see these two shapes in the same set, you can start to think of maybe in set A, there's always seven sides, or in set A, there's always an odd number of sides. So another example of a comparable set of squares would be just in one square, you see nothing but a square, and in another one, you see perhaps a triangle and a circle. You, you know that these will all add up to four sides. So if you see the combination of these two in any set, start to think about the odd versus even number of sides between set A and set B, or just a specific number of sides in general in one particular set. Next up, we've got overlapping shapes with intersection. So something that looks like this, maybe. Okay. So if there's multiple shapes, so for example, there's a circle and then a triangle, it's good to start to think about the number of intersections slash the enclosed spaces that there might be. However, if there's only two shapes involved, then you can start to think about the particular shape of the intersection that is made. And if not that, then start to combine the number of sides of both of these shapes. Next, whenever you see just a random line going through a shape like this, then that probably has something to do with intersections. Because if you think about it, it's just a like a cheat code way of adding another intersection when you're too lazy to make a question. Next, and this was mentioned in the color class, when you have literally the most obvious pattern in the world, black versus white, then it's probably more than just that. So start to think about an additional odd versus even pattern that could come up like so. Next, whenever I see non-basic shapes, like <laughs> my, my definition of basic is anything with four sides or less. So if it has more than four sides, then I struggle to count. But like a pentagon or a hexagon, anything with more than five sides, basically, or five sides or more, then start to think about angle being potentially a pattern because these are all essentially going to be obtuse angles. And if you compare that to a triangle, which only has acute angles, or this particular triangle only has acute angles, then the 
pattern could be something to do with acute or, or the number of acute angles and obtuse angles in set A versus set B. So for example, in set A could be an odd number of acute angles and an even number of obtuse angles. Whereas in set B, it's the opposite. Odd number of obtuse and even number of acute. Next, whenever you see arrowheads, like this or this, this would count as two arrowheads, start to think about the number of arrowheads. And I think it's very similar to the number of dots in the fact that it's just an invitation for you to start counting how many arrowheads there are. Now, if if you've got arrowheads and there's, if you've got arrowheads of dots and there's one central shape, and you've got dots and everything, then the dots have to relate to something, right? So in this case, the only thing it has to relate to is the central shape. So it probably has to do with the number of sides of this particular shape. So you've got four sides on the shape, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So maybe it's something to do like n plus two, number of dots. So a number of sides plus two equals the number of dots that you get. However, if you've got those dots and you've got multiple shapes lying around, one, two, three, four, five, six, so six dots again, and you've got three shapes here, then it could be something like, it, it's more likely to do with the actual number of shapes themselves rather than the number of sides of the shapes. So it could be in this case, N plus three, where N is the number of shapes and then plus three number of dots. Or it could be in this case that there's two dots for every one shape. Cool. Now, moving on to our next one. If you see a, if you see one shape that is repeated quite a lot and other boxes that have less shapes, but there's only really ever two to three specific shapes going on, then it's probably a formulaic pattern. So I'll draw it out just so we have an idea of what's going on. Alrighty, so here is an example of such a pattern. Now, when I, when I say a formulaic pattern, what I mean is it's one of those patterns where the circle is equal to one, the triangle is equal to two, maybe there's a square as well that is equal to three. And if you add up all the values inside a particular square, it will add up to a specific number. So, for example, in set A here, you can see that there's repetition of a specific shape. And you can see that in another box in set A, you've still got the circle, but now you've got the triangle and there's less shapes in general. The reason is because this triangle is inherently worth more points. So you don't need as many to make up whatever the number is. In this case, you can tell that the number is going to be, or the value in total is going to be five because of the five circles here. So with that in mind, if you subtract this one from five, you're left with four. Four divided by the two triangles gives you a value of two for this triangle. How do you know that the circle is going to be worth one? Well, because it's the most repeated shape that there is. And if that's the case, then if you need more of one thing to make up a value, that means that that one thing is worth less. So that's why, you know, get the circle here would be worth one. And if we compare that to set B where you've got six circles instead and three triangles, each with the value of two, giving us the value of six, you can see how this can be a pattern where you've got uh, set A adding up to the number five and set B adding up to the number six. Usually there's a third shape involved, but if you just apply the same mechanism here, it's, uh, it's dual. You can solve it. Now, whenever you see only two to three specific shapes present throughout all of the boxes, so let's just keep with the same shapes, circle, square, and a triangle. It could be exactly what we've just gone through. Or... It could be that there's a specific number of certain shapes in each set. So maybe in set A, there's always four circles. And in set B, there's always three circles. Okay. Two squares here and three squares here. Something like that. Could be the specific number of a shape. And oftentimes, if that's the case, then color can actually be a distractor. Now, keep in mind, it could go the complete other way around, where the pattern might actually have to do with the color and the shapes themselves could be the distractor. So for example, perhaps in set B, there's always, so sorry, in set A, there's always four black shapes. 
whereas in ZB, as always, four white shapes or three black shapes if you want to compare the black shapes in particular. Three white if you compare those. Okay, so in that case, the actual shapes themselves might not matter. They could, but perhaps not. And the color is the main pattern that we're thinking of here. Next, whenever you see faces, perhaps you've seen some of these patterns before where they try and make faces out of um, different shapes. Start to think about the different number of elements that are required to make that particular pattern. It's not so much about symmetry. It's not so much about the shapes involved. It's about the number of shapes. So here, what I would be doing is start to count the number of elements. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight. You can't forget the head there as well. So eight elements there. So in set A could be that you've got an even number of elements creating that face, but in set B, it could be an odd number of elements creating that face. Now, if that's not working for you, then it might pay to pay attention to one element in particular. Okay, so here, what we can do is start to think about the number of circles. You can see the circle comes up quite a bit. Perhaps that has something to do with it. So one, two, three, four, five. You've got five circles that make up the face. So it could be that the number of circles are odd in set A and even in set B. That could be the case as well. But in general, whenever you see faces, start to count something. Start to count the number of elements that make up that face, either in general or specifically restricted to one element. Alrighty. So next, whenever you see those Tetris blocks, like this and this, where somehow they're supposed to fit together to form a block or something, then start to think about the actual number of blocks there are. Obviously, you can see here, it's going to fit together nicely. You've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So it's going to make something like a 3 by 5 rectangle. You know that's going to be the case, just because this is clearly simple to see. But sometimes it's not going to be so simple to see. Sometimes the shapes are going to be everywhere, you're going to have lone dots here. This is going to be broken up into three different chunks. So how do you know if that fits into a 3 by 5 Look, for me, the easiest thing to do is just count the number of shapes. Count the number of smaller squares. If it adds up to 15, chances are it's probably going to form a 3 by 5 Obviously, if you see a really long pillar, like... Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you've got eight blocks here, then it's not going to fit into this three by five. It's just because it's too long. So there it, you can think, okay, it's way too long. It won't fit into set A, which is a three by five, and hence I'm gonna pick neither for that. But in general, honestly, if you just count the number of squares and they're always either 15 or 20 or nine or 16, whatever the number is, you you're likely to get at least three out of five of those questions correct. Probably more, just off the number of little squares alone. So just count the number of little squares that add up to whatever the number all adds up to, then you're set, ready to go. Now, next, I like to call these the convoluted tic-tac-toe boxes. So whenever you see something like this, the immediate thing to start doing is to count the number of enclosed spaces. Probably something like odd versus even. Next, whenever you see sawtooth lines like so, start to count the number of lines that make up the sawtooth. So it, it obviously be more pointed than rounded than I've done there. So it'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So maybe in set A, it's odd number of lines, and in set B, it's an even number of lines that make up the sawtooth pattern. Next. And finally, whenever you see bird's eye view, a empty looking set and a fuller, a denser looking set, this could be a potential trigger for you to start to think about this number pattern, which is perhaps in set A, there is one circle for every square. So if there's two squares here, there'd be two circles here. Whereas in set B, it could look something like there are two squares for every circle. So circle and two squares. So now you can imagine if there's 
two circles here. There'd be one, two, three, four squares. And you can already start to see just how different in terms of density something like this is to something like this. So if, again, you see empty versus full on your bird's eye view scan, start to think about this being your potential number pattern. So with all that being said, I think that is all the triggers that I had at the top of my mind. Hopefully you've gotten some value out of this. Unfortunately, again, I couldn't go through the questions with you, but with these triggers in mind, if you go and do your practice questions and try and apply these triggers, hopefully you'll be able to get to your patterns quicker, which means you'll be able to save more time, meaning your UCAT score goes up. So with that being said, thank you. And I will see you all in the next video.